John, we have a head of baseball operations who's been in the news a lot this offseason. Yeah, Heim Bloom, uh, chief baseball officer, I believe he is called from the Red Sox, which is the same as the GM. And uh, he has been in the eye of the storm, just got booed at uh, one of the recent events up in uh, New England. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact he's going to come on when he is under a lot of heat right now. Well, we'll ask him about that heat. We'll ask him about his moves, his non-moves, players kept, players gone. We'll also talk about our thoughts about how the Hall of Fame is voted for. And we'll do hit and error as we do each week. If you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. We're back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. And John, uh, we're uh, doing this on Wednesday. We usually do it on Tuesday because on Tuesday, the Hall of Fame vote came out. Uh, Scott Rowland got in by five votes. Todd Helton fell short by 11. He was at 72.2%. Billy Wagner closed 68.1%. Andrew Jones, 581 Those feel like guys who are in the trajectory uh, to maybe get in as well. But we're already on to next. And part of that is I thought you wrote an interesting column in Wednesday's New York Post about some concerns you have about the voting uh, and how it's uh, manifested over the last few years. Why don't you take us through some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I've been defending uh, we writers for years and saying we do a good job. Sure, we're tough. It should be tough. The Hall of Fame should be about the great players of the game. And uh, I thought we didn't, we're not doing a great job at this point. I, I, I think it doesn't make any sense to me and not to criticize any of the candidates. And I did vote for Scott Rowland, but not to criticize any of the candidates. But four years ago, all of those candidates uh, at the top got 17 percent. Uh, Kent also got 17, 18 percent. But Helton did. Wagner did. And Roland did. And in four short years, more than half the electorate has changed its mind. To me, I think we look wishy-washy. Not saying that uh, these That's guys the word you deserving. used in your column, wishy-washy. Yeah, I'm repeating. I'm repeating. My you know, I think we're too easily influenced by what's on Twitter. And, uh, you know, somebody throws out a great stat and everyone says, oh, yeah, I was wrong. Now he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, I, you know, I generally, I think we need to stick to our guns more. I, I don't think we're, I think we're doing something wrong here. So, uh, John, I, I thought Tom Verducci on MLB Network's coverage said something that really struck me yesterday, which was, and I, I wonder if you feel this way, because I agreed with him. I think when you and I became voters, we were very tough. We were almost looking for reasons not to put guys in, right? Like, what is the borderline? Hey, this is supposed to be the greatest of the great, not just great. And he said he feels like the voting today is people are looking for reasons to try to get people in. And I do think now I do think that's influenced to your point by social media, where people feel like they want to be popular on social media or not get beat up. But I do think the attitude in general has changed from, hey, this is the toughest goal line stand in the world to, hey, we could let some guys score here. Well, I think part of that is the precedent. We have let in more guys or more guys have gotten in via the Veterans Committee. And, you know, you'd like to think that we're as fair as possible. So if you have, see a player who's almost identical or at least very comparable to somebody else who's already in, you know, you don't want to exclude that player. So I, I think I've relaxed a bit. I could see you voted for two guys. So uh, it's good you're still doing the Joe Sherman <laughs> thing. Uh, I did vote for four. I guess the average was six. So I don't know. We're, we're both a little tougher than average. Uh, but, you know, I do think so, there is a precedent there. And I, I, you want to be fair about it. You know, you don't want to have your own standard. The Hall of Fame at this point has a standard. So I think it's reasonable that we have uh, relaxed it a tiny bit, not a tremendous amount. I mean, there are 28 good players on this ballot. All of them were very good players. In, yeah. in the you don't top get on the ballot. There's the a screening game, committee. And only one got in. Right? Yeah, there's a screening. I'm on the screening committee that puts people on the ballot. So, you know, there's a, you know, there's some rules about how you get on the ballot 10 years in the major leagues, whatever, but not just every player gets on. There is, you know, uh, some standard to get on. So you picked the ballot that you ultimately rejected then? No, you picked it because <laughs> I think the ballot day should be a actual bigger day than it is, John. Because I think the way I think about the who I put, remember, who I put up on the ballot, I there's a lot of guys on the ballot who were not on my ballot to be on the ballot, right? I'm even tough on that. 
Yeah, okay. I'm thinking about who are the five, the top 5% of players who've ever played. If you reach that standard in whatever, in my mind, I think this is a day to honor you to say, it's very hard to play major league baseball. You did it at a great level. This is your day. You're on the ballot. I didn't imagine that we'd put them all on the ballot and then people would find a reason to somehow vote for 10 of these guys. But I will say something about something you said, and it's one of the things that bothers me, is I hear all the time, well, so-and-so was in, so then well, shouldn't we put that guy in? I always ask first, well, did you vote for so-and-so? If you didn't, it's like telling me George Santos is in Congress now, so really, let's lower the standard for everyone I'm going to vote for for the rest <laughs> of my life. Anyone could make up their whole life story. Like, what's it matter who else got voted for? Have a Hall of Fame standard. And that's your Hall of Fame standard. Stop saying X got voted in, so now Y gets voted in. Yeah, well, I wouldn't go by one outlier or two outliers that got in via the, the vet, which I think the Veterans Committee does a good job by and large. But they, I think they do a, a terrible job, John, because they're not transparent. Well, they, much right. they should committee. be transparent. I agree with that. But you know, I I do think they've got in put in some guys that we should have put in. I thought Jack Morris was a Hall of Famer. All, ultimately, I I voted for Trammell and he got in. Uh, McGriff, I voted for every single time. He never got any traction at all by the writers. You know, I'm really questioning the writers. And one more I'll question the, the writers on is uh, not to be personal or anything. And, and again, it's not about personality. We had Jimmy Rollins on last week and he was terrific. And he, like almost every player, thinks it's somewhat about personality. And look, I mean, Eddie Murray got almost every vote. He didn't talk to writers. Steve Carlton was... Uh, notoriously bad with the writers. He got almost every vote. I don't think it's about personality. Jeff Kent's not a guy I got along with. I support not only support him, I trumpet him in my columns and say he should be in. Andy Pettit, I loved, and he did not uh, get my support. He's close, like a lot of these guys, but I don't get the Gary Sheffield thing at all. He is, I, I get why Billy Wagner is moving up and Helton. I understand that, although I haven't voted for them yet. I, I get it. Gary Sheffield, I just don't get help. Help me on this one because he's now over fifty percent. He's trending better than Bonds. Uh, they both were in Balco. Uh, I don't see a, a huge difference other than Bonds uh, was got better steroids or something, or did better. He he became so great that it's so obvious that he did steroids. Whereas Sheffield kind of acted ticked off when he got caught. I mean, to me, it was a little bit like Ortiz who. Bluffed it off like, oh, this is nothing, whatever. And it, it seemed like it. everybody bought it. And same thing with Sheffield. He's now getting 55% of the vote, something like that. To me, he's a borderline candidate anyway. Great hitter, one-dimensional, but great, great hitter. No steroids? Yes, I get it. Explain this to me, how he's, get, he's getting more support than Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds. I, I don't get it. I, I just don't think we're making much sense lately. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of what you said before, John, I, and what I said. I think people are looking for reasons to get in. I think as we get further away from the the guts of what is known as the steroid era, uh, there's fewer people around who kind of remember how distorted it all felt. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, look, I, I, I know there's a group that's just, hey, the 10 guys with the best statistics. I'm like, I don't know. Like, what if a guy went up there and he had like a thing in his eye, he could put in his eye and he knew what pitch was coming every time. Like, <laughs> would you just say like, hey, the statistics say this, like at some point we're filters, we're not stenographers. You're supposed to filter and decide it. So I think there's that. Can I do something that's going to be very different here? Can I defend the voting? Because I will say that th this voting always comes in the middle of two things. The Football Hall of Fame just announced who its finalists were. They'll announce the finals. And the uh, at the Super Bowl, I think it comes. And the Oscars just came out. And you could say whatever you want about the baseball writers. I'll always go back to it's hard to get the three quarters of the vote, right? Five guys were over 50% yesterday. One got in. Seven were over last year. One got in. You know, short of North Korean uh elections if you get over 50 percent, you're usually happy right like it's hard to get in and we are so much more transparent our body not the veterans committee bodies than any of these other things like the oscars get nominated who votes how did they vote somebody named andrea risebro did a movie called two leslie she got best actress it comes out like she had all these powerful friends who were taking people to dinners and like building her candidacy like historically i'd love to know how 
like Goodfellas, like did Goodfellas in 1980 lose by like one vote to that piece of crap dances with wolves <laughs> or did it like, how did that happen? The NFL hall of fame, they have writers go in and they make speeches for the players they want. Like Gary Myers will do at this year's Daryl Darrell Revis, right? Like it's his job to try to do that. Can you imagine next year we get in a room and we're trying to sell David Wright? What a ridiculous way this is to do it. <laughs> Whatever you think about it, well, more than three quarters of us make our ballots public. Most of the people who do that, like you and me, in various forms, in our situations, writing TV podcasts, we explain who we voted and why we voted for it. All these other elections, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, NHL Hall of Fame, NBA Hall of Fame, who vote? I don't know. How did they vote? I don't know. Was it close? We don't get like a final tabulation. Was it close? Was it not close? So with all the problems with us, I would say we're the most transparent, information-heavy voting group when it comes to a Hall of Fame that there is. Yeah, and I love the fact that it gets so much attention. You know, obviously there's controversy and um, all sorts of discussion about it, and it goes on for days as we're doing it. And uh, certainly it's the best hall, and uh, I, I think overall it's great. Uh, I, I'm with you on the transparency, and I always reveal my votes, but – it feels like the transparency has hurt things in a way because now people are afraid to admit, oh, I didn't vote for this cool guy or that cool guy or this guy with this new stat that all these Sabre guys are telling us it must must be in. And I think everybody should make their independent decision. And that, that to me, is not happening. I think we've gotten to the point of groupthink because there's really no other explanation why you'd have three or four guys go from 17% to 70%. And again, I think they were all very good players right on the border, which is not a, a rip to be on the border of the top 1%. But to have more than half the electorate change their mind in four years, uh, they're getting convinced. And why Why are they getting convinced? I think part of it is they're afraid to admit uh, who they did vote for based on the fact they'll get, they'll get bashed by somebody or think they will. Well, John, we'll just have to be the last guys on the lawn screaming, curmudgeons, getting bashed because we're going to try to hold the standard. Uh, I, I agree. By the way, I agree with you. I think that this controversy and stuff actually ends up being good for our sport. We hardly ever talk about national issues anymore. We're very local driven in baseball. And, uh, you know, I think that I, I, I'm willing to deal with the storm that comes with being a voter because I think it's good for the thing, for for the industry. On the subject, John, of people dealing with storms, our next guest when you come back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman is the besieged head of baseball operations of the Boston Red Sox, Time Blue. Welcome back to the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. We're so happy to have uh, the top baseball executive. No one has ever called general manager anymore, Haim. So I'm not even going to guess at like the emperor or whatever it is exactly. <laughs> That's the title. But you're the top baseball executive, what used to be the general manager of the Boston Red Sox. Haim Bloom, thank you so much for joining us in what has suddenly become a very busy portion of your offseason. Yeah. Um, well, look, it's good to be busy. Um, we will always want to be able to make moves that uh, have a chance to help us get where we want to go. You never know when during the off season those are going to be able to happen. Uh, so <laughs> good to be busy at this time of year. Oh, Haim, if I'm going to, I'm going to start with a real softball here. No, I'm not going to start with softball. So what, what I, I wonder what it feels like to be in the center of the storm. You were a much desired executive when you came to the Red Sox, You're well known you were up very to the end for the Met job. Uh, you came there. And right now you're in a period where you're being besieged by fans, reporters, you and the ownership were booed at some events, uh, shouted down. You're trying to execute a plan that obviously makes sense in your mind. What is it like to be in a big baseball town and be thought of in this way right now? It's just part of it. I mean, look, you know, in 21, obviously, we didn't accomplish everything we wanted to in 21, but I got to live the other side of it. You can't have one without the other. You just can't. Um, I, You know, it's it, it, there are very few, if any, places in the country that care as much about baseball as Boston does. And that's what's going to come with this. I mean, I was I was walking in today uh, to the office and you know, somebody on the street stopped me to tell me how fired up they were about Adalberto Mondesi. Um, <laughs> you know, independent of the opinion, like positive or negative, you don't get that in most places. 
Uh, people are really, really locked in here. I actually had a blast at Winter Weekend. I mean, the town hall was an intense experience, but it's something I expected uh, because I know how passionate our fans are. And I probably talked about 500 fans during the course of the weekend. And uh, it just fires you up how much people care. Well, I got to say, Chaim, I think you've handled it uh, terrifically. Um, you know, I, I think even your uh, team president, Sam Kennedy, said it's really more on them, on the ownership group. And certainly your payroll is not up there at this moment with the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Mets, some other big market teams. Um, and a lot of people are projecting that you guys to come in, obviously a great division, probably the best division in baseball uh, at or near the bottom. How do you see your team right now? I know you've been busy lately. You've made several moves in the last couple of weeks. Uh, is there more to do or do you feel fairly comfortable that you're better than people are perceiving? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, first of all, to the to the payroll question, the resources question, look, I mean, obviously, um, you know, there are going to be teams at a payroll level that we're not. We, we're not I'm not going to hide that or, or, or run from it. But, you know, we have plenty of resources to succeed. You know, that should never be an excuse. Um, I do think, you know, some of what we've been going through the last few years is just, a, you know, just a testament to the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of things, uh, you know, actions have consequences, the things that you do that are good, some of them pay off in the moment, some of them pay off down the road and vice versa for the things that you do, um, you know, that 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 aren't as good and you eventually live those consequences and we've been working through a period of trying to win while, you know, working through, frankly, like a talent base that wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, regardless of the recent success. That's not a secret either. Uh, now, there are trade-offs when you try to do that. You know, there's some that we've hit on and there's a couple that we'd like to do over. I don't think that's that different from uh, any other club. At the end of the day, you know, the results are what matter. And I do think, you know, we live this in 21. Uh, I've seen it here, you know, from the outside in this town. Uh, you know, the, the 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 projections, the projected standings, those only mean so much. Um you know, usually the way things work in a place like Boston is obviously when uh, you're on top of the world, you're really on top of the world. And then, you know, the same sort of thing that might be looked on one way if it were happening in a different city is going to get looked on a lot more negatively when it's not perfect, uh, when it happens here. We want it to be perfect. That is what we're shooting for. But we can't really worry about all the noise that accompanies this other stuff. But I can tell you, I do think being around our group uh, at Winter Weekend, you know, certainly uh, having all of our staff in last week for organizational meetings, uh, how it feels inside the house is is very different from the perception. That doesn't mean, uh, you know, that that I'm arguing with where, you know, people are going to pick us where they're, where they're going to pick us. We like our team. We recognize, you know, we're not expecting anybody to pick us to go out there and steamroll anybody. But we have a lot of talent on the team. We have a club that should fit together a lot better than last year's team did. And you know, we have the ability to go out there if we play well, if we throw strikes, if we grind at bats, we have the ability to get to the postseason. And that's really what we're focused on. Heim, uh, when I ask uh, executives from other teams about the Red Sox, that one of the perceptions that comes up a lot is that you probably had plan A, like every team, plan A and plan B and plan C, and that you guys probably ended up on plan F or something, that some stuff you wanted to do got got more expensive maybe than you thought uh players desired to play someplace else is this even close to what you imagined this off season would look like or are you really on a plan f or g or h i don't really think about it that way i mean some of the stuff and some of it was reported there were some players we pursued that for various reasons just ended up with other clubs you know maybe there's a little more of that this off season than there usually is but that's not atypical i think that gets back to uh you know just the visibility of of operating here, especially in the way that the landscape of the industry, the media landscape is now, um, you know, in any given off season, again, lived through this a couple years ago, uh, going into 21, where we get linked to so many players, there's truth to some of that, you know, some of them are totally made up. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you're not going to sign 300 players. You may get linked to 300 players. So every time you miss someone, just in the, in the way the landscape is, it kind of reverberates and, you know, it creates some sort of perception that may not really be real. There are there are always different paths that the offseason can go. We know that. There's a lot of different players we're going to target. Uh, at the end of the day, we're happy with with who we've ended up with. We'd still like to do more. Uh, but it's it's no different from really any other offseason in that there are always guys you go after 
that for various reasons, uh, it doesn't work out and the club comes together one of a number of different ways. It so happened this winter, we obviously had a lot of different targets just given uh, both the flexibility that we had and also um, you know, the nature of our team and where we were looking to address needs. And so that led to a much bigger target list. And we knew we weren't going to come away with uh, only a certain number of guys that we were going to cast a wide net uh, of players we liked and end up with a number of them. And that's what happened. Uh, to paraphrase, you said moves have consequences. And I guess the fans will look at a couple of non-moves and, and talk about those because obviously you had a couple of uh, homegrown superstars and just like you to address exactly how you feel things turned out. And um, I'm obviously referring to Mookie Betts and to Xander Bogarts. And we, you know, obviously Bogarts has just left recently, so it's a little bit harder to evaluate it. But uh, do you have any regrets in the Betts situation and even in the Bogarts situation? Because I, I do think that the money went beyond where you and anybody else thought it was going to go. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's good that you bring it up. It actually kind of relates to what you guys were talking about uh, that I actually chose to talk about a little bit at the town hall on Friday, uh, as opposed to, you know, knowing it was it was a little bit of a hostile room, but I didn't want to give a can answer. I wanted to kind of break this down for people of the wh why, you know, where we were then and where we are now. And that really dictated our approach to that situation. And then the situation that we faced this winter with Rafi um who we who we retained um but basically you know the way we looked at it with Mookie it, you know there there was so much uh noise around that situation that I I think it was really simple for us and for me coming in here anew believe me I fully appreciated and continue to appreciate the player that he is I mean that's beyond question beyond reproach I think it really came down to uh the way baseball is if you are going to you know, make a bet that big on a superstar player uh, that big and that long, you better be prepared to back it up with a ton of talent around that player, especially in the early years of the deal when you can expect it uh, to return the most value. And simply put, we just weren't positioned to do that. Um, so that's not going to get you anywhere. And you see examples of it all the time in our game, uh, where if you have the superstar, but you don't have, you know, that sustainable core around that superstar, you don't win. And you end up potentially hurting yourself and digging yourself deeper into a hole. So it just wasn't going to make sense, regardless of of uh, his talent, to to you know ante up in that way. And that doesn't make it any less painful. Uh, nothing can really take the pain away from a fan perspective. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think you know you look at you know both the way that deal went and then the situation we're in now. And 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 I do think the proof's in the pudding. I, you know, obviously. 20, we knew was going to be an uphill battle for any number of reasons. Obviously, there were so many things in 20 that didn't go our way. When I look at 21, um, you know, I, I think that trade helped us win. It didn't help us win because uh, Alex Verdugo is, you know, outperformed Mookie. But Doogie had a great year. Uh, but that wasn't really it. It was that because of what, you know, we did with that trade, we were then able to add to the team in any number of ways. And we added Kike Hernandez and we added Hunter Renfro and we added Adam Adovino and we added Garrett Richards and others that would have been much harder for us to do, especially coming out of a, a, a lost pandemic season and facing the possibility of zero fans in Fenway for a second straight year. It would have been really hard to do that. We were appreciative that we had the flexibility we had, but, um, you know, that trade set us up to then put talent around our core to be able to win. Uh, and we did. And obviously we fell six wins short of the goal that we had. Um, but, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do that without, you know, making that very, very difficult decision. Now, look, in 22, obviously, the moves we made to, to, to augment our core didn't work as well. We own that. And as far as the trade itself, obviously, you know, one of the pieces from that trade uh, isn't with the organization anymore and didn't pan out. And, you know, maybe he will in the future. But that's another thing we have to own. But as far as the thought process and as far as, you know, how it set us up, I, I feel good about that uh, as painful as the decision was you know now we're in a different situation obviously we expect to be able to back up the bet in terms of uh, how we've set ourselves up with you know the rest of Rafi's prime and beyond because we're in a different situation with the talent we have coming and the ability to use our resources to add to that core and, and that's why uh, we we went big on him. There's so many things I want to ask off of that so I just let me see if I could ask a big picture question uh Heim, it's uh, when you took over, is this a where you imagine you'd be in three years? Because 
as I'm sitting and looking at your major league roster right now, I would say if there was a dispersal draft tomorrow, Rafael Devers would go first. When I look at your talent base on your major league roster, I'm not sure who would go second. Is that Garrett Whitlock? Is it Hulk? I'm, I'm not sure. Is this really the amount of talent you imagined you'd be putting on the major league field in 2023 when you took over before 2020? I think you're missing a few talented players on that, that I think would be in the running, you know, for that. And you mentioned two that are really talented. There's a couple others I'd, I'd put in that group. Um, and, you know, I can tell you, you know, just from the conversations we've had and, you know, who gets asked on in trades, I, I think the industry recognizes that too. Um, you know, look, I, we knew it was going to take time to really repopulate the young talent. We've had a couple guys, uh, you know, come through this organization uh, that are headed to our big league roster that, and really have already joined our big league roster that we expect really great things out of. We've had some young players come up here also and, and take their lumps. Uh, that is going to happen in any, in any situation. Um, we need to keep adding to that talent base. Look, if you told me three years ago, you know, three years out, uh, you're going to be in a situation where you have a vastly improved farm system. You have a lot of under control young pitching on your major league roster. And oh, by the way, you almost went to the World Series once in that time. You know, I, I would think we were right on track. Uh, obviously, you know, that was a year ago. We didn't we didn't build on that in 2022, uh, at least not in terms of our major league results. We have to own that. But, you know, just stepping back from it, compare the talent and, and the upside of the young arms that we have now with what was here three years ago, the arms that are on the roster uh, the arms that are coming. I mean, you mentioned a couple of young pitchers and left off the one that I think most of the industry would would probably, you know, have out in front of those guys. And obviously all of them will determine, you know, who ends up where in that pecking order. Uh, but we feel really good about that. And and now it's on us to to keep pushing that crop of position players up uh, to surround Rafi and, and help us on that side of the ball as well. Yeah, I just want to follow up on the homegrown stars. And I think we were in contact a couple of weeks before Devers and it seemed pretty clear you didn't really hide the fact that you need to get that done and you were able to get that done. Um, so just to follow up again on Bogertz, you, you, it sounded like from what we gathered, you'd offered a somewhat close to what Swanson ended up getting. So the, the final offer was seems fairly reasonable, but do you have any regrets about the spring offer, the early offer to add one year on him? And did, did you feel like you absolutely had to get Devers done? And, I think he did get it done pretty well too, because looking at that contract with the deferrals, it is worth less than 300 million, which at, at, at this point, it looks, you know, I mean, obviously he's a great player. Looks like a good deal for both sides, including your side. Yeah. And hopefully it will end up being that we felt that way. Obviously there's so much give and take in those negotiations. It started with, you know, Rafi wanting to be here and, uh, you know, no, also understanding that there was a value point that he felt he had to reach in order to make that worthwhile. Uh, and glad that we were able to find the path to, you know, to get it done in a way that worked for everybody. Um, you know, to the other question, I, this is something I've talked about a lot, and I actually haven't shied away from this. I said, you know, after after Bogey signed, um, you know, with, with San Diego, just knowing what he means um, and our role in that process and that decision that, you know, is something, you know, I was going to take every question and, and have. And good for him to get that deal. I mean, we're not going to, you know, run away from the fact that that was just something that we weren't going to do. That sometimes you serve yourself best as an organization by making really difficult decisions and breaking your own heart. But I actually think when you look at the history of this organization over the last couple of decades, not all of those have been perfect decisions, right? But there have been a lot of players, some of them stayed and, and many of them didn't. And I think on the whole, the organization has been served pretty well. And, and the results have proven that out, that, you know, when you do what feels good in the moment every time, or even most of the time, you do sometimes pay a price for that, even when it's a great player, even when it's a player that you love. As far as getting to this point, I, you know, I understand the criticism. I, I do think the way the story gets told from the outside is probably a little bit uh, of a skewed reality in terms of what was possible. The way I look at it, obviously, Bogey, you know, it, it's easy to forget. Bogey did choose to, uh, and, and the organization did extend him once. He put off uh, that right to free agency, uh, but he got himself and, and Scott did a good job negotiating for him and opt out to allow him to test the market again at a prime age. That wasn't an accident. You don't usually see those things in there and not get used. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think it's, it's very easy to look back and, 
you know, certainly we do and say there's certain things we might not have handled perfectly. Totally accept that. And I, and I understand that criticism. I also think the reality of it uh, is that, you know, there, there was a value in mind uh, that, that Xander and Scott had that, you know, good for them. They were able to get it, but I think, you know, realistically, they were very likely to go out and test the market, at least see what that value point was. It's one thing to put that uh, right off once. It's not something you usually see a player put off a second time. So we weren't surprised that he uh, chose to go out there and do it. And, and all the conversations uh, with Scott on that, even dating back to the spring, really led us to think that, uh, you know, that was where this was going. And we were hopeful in that process that we were going to be able to retain him. Obviously we didn't. And obviously that hurts, but uh you know, we're, we're going to turn the page and move forward as the organization has done many times. It, it doesn't take anything away from the bond between him and our fans and the city and the organization and a lot of people in the organization. Uh, but it's part of the game and uh, we'll move forward as the organization has uh, many times before. Hi, uh, you, you obviously are thoughtful and have been relatively cautious, especially when it comes to long-term contracts in your, in your time with the Red Sox. When you jumped out, the first significant one you did was Trevor Story and the industry, there was a lot of talk that he had an elbow issue. And nevertheless, you did that. And I just wonder, like looking back, we keep trying to do the 2020 hindsight thing, forgive me for that. But like, like if you make that offer at that time to Bogarts, do you have Xander Bogarts instead of Trevor Story? And do you have some regrets about how you handled that combination right now? Well, I view them as pretty independent. Um, you know, I think the idea, uh, I don't know how many times I could say that Trevor wasn't brought in here to replace Bogey, uh, and to have people believe me, they can believe me or not, but we didn't look at it that way. You know, obviously you do plan out ahead and, you know, you think about different things that could happen. We knew again, because of the opt out, it was not a certainty that he would be here, but the idea that one was brought in to replace the other just isn't true. Um, you know, that, that's really all I can say about that. I think they're independent situations. Again, I just talked about Xander's situation. Like I said, I, I, I think, you know, that having had that right to go test free agency, it was pretty clear in my mind from the conversations we had uh, around the time we signed Trevor uh, that, you know, that was something that in all likelihood he was going to do. Um, you know, as far as Trevor is concerned, obviously, look, the, the nature and the timing uh, of, of this of this surgery. Thankfully it was not a full Tommy John is obviously tough. You know, it's a, it's a big blow. He's going to miss, you know, at a minimum, a good chunk of 2023. That's not ideal, but you know, we did a lot of homework on obviously the issues that he had I actually thought that, but for those issues, he would have uh, probably gone at a much, much higher value point as a free agent. And uh, you know, he, he went through uh, all of 2022 uh, without uh, you know, not even just without, any kind of elbow problem, but also, you know, sometimes you see guys when they're grinding through stuff, they need extra treatment. Um, you know, you can, you can see them doing a lot of extra things to get ready to play. And that just wasn't the case with Trevor. It stinks, obviously how this, how this played out. Um, you know, no one feels worse about it than he does, but for all that, this guy last year, uh, even with not really having his arm strength back after the injury in 2021, for me, it was the best defensive second baseman in the game. Um, the things he did on the field were remarkable. So, you know, even in that state, obviously still trying to find his way off of, uh, you know, the fallout from that injury, he did such a good job. I mean, that's part of why he's going to be missed so much. And, and I think the fact that, um, you know, this is, you know, a, a blow to our club, I think just is a credit to the player that we got. I want to talk to you about the guy who will be manning shortstop at the beginning of the year, at least appears that he will be the shortstop. And, that was a very good move to get Kike Hernandez, very versatile player. He was outstanding in center field. Now he's going to be, it looks like, as of today at least, you're starting shortstop. I think he's going to be in the WBC and not play shortstop. And he isn't proven as a starting shortstop. Um, you know, how much concern do you have, you know, being a big market team? This is a very important position that he's going to be the guy and you know, it looks like maybe you've just added Mondesi. I know that the fan was very excited. You mentioned to us uh, beforehand, uh, or maybe it was during the show, about uh, adding Mondesi. But it still looks like you might be able to add another player for the middle infield, uh, maybe as a backup. I'm not sure. 
How do you, how comfortable do you feel right now with Kike as your starter and do you need to add somebody else to bulk it up? Yeah, look, we always want to add as much talent as we can. You guys should have Kike on here. Ask him about how, how he feels about it. Um, he is dead certain that he is going to be just fine. Super excited about the opportunity. Uh, having watched him play a little bit over there, I have no doubts that he can handle it. Obviously, he hasn't done it as a starter for a full season. And look, we'll see how things unfold. Obviously, it's our responsibility to build as much depth, as many options as we can there's no one player who should be shouldering all the load for this team. You you need to build a roster that fits together is part of why we went out and, and, and got Mondesi. Um, but I have no doubt his physical ability over there at the position. He'll show you everything you need. It's part of why we liked him two years ago. It's part of why we jumped out to extend him this summer is because you could argue this guy is a plus defender everywhere on the field, but catcher. And he'd probably tell you, he could do that too. The thing that, that stands out, beyond the physical ability it's just the head for the game that he has the instincts that's so important at that position uh because you really put in positions where you know you, you have to know what to do with the baseball and this guy really really sees the game well part of what made him such a good outfielder he's been a good infielder in the past he understands the game and in, it's one of those positions where instincts are so important he's also I, I think really behind the scenes and maybe a little bit out front taking much more of a leadership role this offseason which is also what you want to see uh, at that position. So, you know, obviously we're going to continue to build uh, as deep uh, and as good and as functional of a roster as we can, uh, but we feel really good about him over there uh, and in line to take that opportunity. You know, earlier when you were talking to us, Heim, you mentioned, uh, you know, everyone will do predictions and sometimes things are thwarted. I think there's no more inexplicable team in this century than the Boston Red Sox, right? You've finished last five of the last 11 years and won two championships in that period. And I'm reminded, I, I went and looked it up. I just want to do it real quickly. In the 03-04 off season, no one made a big deal when the Red Sox brought in Todd Walker, Jeremy Giambi, Mike Timlin, Bill Miller, David Ortiz, Bronson Royal, and Kevin Millar. They went to get seven at the ALCS and won the World Series the year after. The In, in the off season of 12-13, they did David Ross, Johnny Gomes, Shane Victorino, Ryan Dempster, Mike Napoli, and Koji Iwahara. Again, it was like not a big deal. And they won the World Series because it hit. And I'm thinking as I look at, you know, you really didn't do stars this year. You have tried to probably deal with a lot of holes along the way here. I think the one that stands out the most is Yoshida. Like I think people have generally, for a guy who got criticized so much for not spending money, you're getting criticized for how much you gave Yoshida. I wonder if you could talk specifically about him. And is that key to us being surprised about what this group of players can do that you put together? Yeah, it's a really good observation. I mean, it, it's funny, obviously, still being a relative newcomer here um, and sort of experiencing uh, as a division rival a lot of those ups and downs of the Red Sox. And certainly seeing how in this town, obviously, when things go well, you can really ride that wave and have some great seasons. And then, um, you know, there has been a lot more up and down than anybody would have wanted over here. And part of our mission here is to try to set things up so that we can get past that and just be continually good. Obviously, we fell short of that in 22. So clearly, we're not there yet. Clearly, we've got work to do to get there. The only way to do that is to have a self-sustained base the only way to compete consistently in this game over long periods of time so that's that is probably our top line goal ahead of anything else uh, that, that as far as something that's ongoing but what you pointed out is that there really has been almost zero correlation arguably a negative correlation between the excitement and the splash factor of the offseason moves and how good the season actually ended up going and that is worth bearing in mind. It doesn't mean we're throwing darts at a board. It doesn't mean people shouldn't have their opinions and their valuations. It just means that uh, for the Red Sox in particular, the assessment of the winter has had basically nothing to do with uh, the standings, which are what count. Um, and, you know, it was interesting with Massa, uh, you know, obviously the way that that unfolded and, uh, you know, the what we ended up doing, the perception of it. Look, there's no doubt, obviously, you know, we put ourselves out there for the guy. That's kind of what you need to do in the free agent market for in-demand players that you want. And we just thought this this aligned and made sense. The one thing I'm very confident about, and it speaks to, you know, why the process unfolded the way it did, um, evaluations um, around the industry and, you know, okay, I, I've heard what's out there. Maybe it wasn't 30 teams, but it doesn't need to be 30 teams. That's not different from any other player. Um, 
we were not on an island with the evaluation of this player. I'm very confident about that. Um, obviously, we extended further than other teams did financially to get him, but that's the case with everybody who signs any free agent, um, except in unique cases where a player might take a discount to go somewhere. That's usually what you need to do. You just need to make sure you're doing it smartly. You're doing it on players you believe in. Uh, but you know, when you actually step back from how the, the hype that the guy got, um, we, you know, we've just basically felt the hype was out of proportion with the actual talent. This guy's been basically the best hitter over there for a while now, and he's done it in a way that tends to translate a lot better to the States. Will he do it? Will he not? Obviously, there's risk. There's also upside. This guy has elite knowledge of the strike zone, elite contact ability. He hits velocity. He hits all different types of pitchers. He is. He has power he has the ability to juice a baseball that's very clear from you know the when you actually look at the balls that he hits so you look at all that stuff and say this ought to translate really well to mlb and it's something we should be willing to bet on given what we know about how those attributes translate on top of having sent in i'd say probably about a total of a dozen evaluators over the last four or five years and coming away with really really strong conviction in his bat i'm uh I had one more question for you. Um, you know, you, first of all, thank you very much for coming on. And, you know, obviously you appeared before all the fans and I know how tough the fans can be in Boston. And, you know, right now you're kind of in the eye of the storm. And, uh, you know, I think you're a very good person for this in terms of your personality. You're very calm. And I think that probably helps you. Uh, you know, are you, you know, you're from Philadelphia and I know you went to school in New England at Yale and you had applied for the Mets job and were one of the three finalists. So that's another job that's always in the eye of the storm. I mean, did you seek out jobs like that on purpose? <laughs> and uh, do you feel, as I do, that you're uh, unusually equipped to work at a, in a Boston at a Queens, New York, rather than, let's say, Des Moines or somewhere in Kansas City? No offense to Kansas City. I mean... To me, uh, I'd be pulling my hair out if I were you with all the criticism that you're getting and you've been very good about it. You know, that, that it's funny. I have done a lot of interviews in this job in three plus years. I think this is the first time anybody has basically asked me, are you a glutton for punishment? <laughs> um, so that's a new one. Um, and, you know, I appreciate to the extent that's a compliment about my disposition. I appreciate it. Look, you know, first of all, about our fans, like our fans are awesome. Yeah, that was that was intense on Friday night. I had a blast at winter weekend. Like, you know, I knew what was coming in that town hall. I knew the environment it was. Let me tell you, like they're locked in. They have really good questions. Even after that town hall, you know, we were getting ushered off the stage and people wanted autographs and selfies, whatever. I could have stayed and done that for an hour. I talked to hundreds of fans over the course of that weekend. A lot of them, you know, opinions all over the place, but they know baseball. They know baseball. You know, some of them were in my corner. Hey, don't listen to them. Love what you're doing. Um, some of them weren't and said, I don't really love what you're doing, but that was uncalled for. It was all over the place. Some of them want to know why this guy, not that guy in November when we set our 40 man roster, you know, what's up with this prospect? What's up with that free agent? The bottom line is that like baseball matters so much here. I've lived it all. Like to me, every experience I've lived the small market experience too. That was a great experience. I wouldn't trade it in. Every experience has its own attributes, um, but I'm having a, I'm having a blast here. Like I, I, we our whole hearts are in what we do. This is a place where you know that that is actually matched by the way all the fans engage with the team. And yeah, when we lose, like people are going to be pissed. They should be. We are too. That's just how it is um you know we're going to be harder on ourselves than anybody's going to be on us so it's just nice to feel that it matters and nice to feel it backed up by everybody who's out there and we know that they when when we earn it back they are going to be here for us and making this place a hell of a tough place to come into uh if if you're an opponent and we know that's there for us when we go out and earn it I'm, we, you showed a good attitude about that and a good attitude in uh, dealing with all of our questions here. We really do appreciate you joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Yeah, happy to talk to you guys. Back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. And John, hit or error time. What do you got, a hit or an error? 
Well, my streak of hit is ending at one. I'm going to go <laughs> error on this one. So uh, I'm not going to be as negative as you probably. But, uh, you know, I like the fact the Kansas City Royals are still working. They're still doing stuff. Uh, they're talking to Granke and might bring him back. And they've certainly enhanced their team lately. But uh, I cannot uh, condone the signing of Aroldis Chapman, who abandoned the Yankees at the end of the year. And obviously we know about his domestic violence issue earlier uh, to make him the closer of a team that probably is not a contender, probably not worth bringing him on board. So I, I did not like that move by the Royals, and uh, that is my error for the week. Yeah, I probably am going to have a Ripken-like streak of going error every week. I guess it's just my personality. So I wonder, look, I understand how tough it is to be the Miami Marlins right now. You're in a division with the Phillies, the Braves, the Mets. They're spending a ton. They have real talent. But I'm wondering what the meeting is like where you say, hey, the shift is being uh, extremely limited. We've got to get great defensively, especially up the middle. And the decision that's made is let's put a third baseman, Joey Wendell, at shortstop. Let's put a first baseman with bad legs, Luis Arise, at second. Let's put a second baseman, Jazz Chisholm, in center. And let's put a second baseman, Gene Segura, at third. I know they'll say it improved the offense, but I don't see by enough. The one strength you do have is really good starting pitching, which you now have diminished by by doing this, this thing on defense, which is going to look worse this year because you have to have rangy players, especially in the middle of the field. I'm not exactly sure what the plan was. I, I get it. They have trouble getting players there. They can't do plan A, plan B. I, I get it. I have real empathy for the teams that struggle to get players to it. But I can't believe this is the plan this year. <laughs> well, thank you for playing to type. I, I appreciate that. And I do think you will have a long streak going. Uh, just to defend my semi-hometown uh, Marlins here, I, I do think they're improved and they do have excellent pitching. And I, I don't want to say nobody wants to go there. Uh, there, there are guys, Chapman wanted to go there for one, and they didn't take him. So I, Well, you would have killed them. them. You would have had another error there if they got him. Yeah, right? and I'm giving them a gold star for not for not taking Chapman. They off, either offered too little or didn't offer anything. So uh, I'll put in a good word for the Marlins there. All right. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll see how that all turns out and talk about it more. Uh, we'll see if my streak of being an error every week continues. If you keep listening to the show, a podcast from the New York Post, Thanks, as always, to Jake Brown and Andrew Hartz, who helped navigate us through this show by producing it. Uh, don't forget the Yes app. It drops uh, usually on Wednesday. It will drop now on Thursday about noon each week. Uh, please take a look at that. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Give us a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify. And don't forget to join us every week on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayes.